thanks for having me. It's a privilege. Great to see old friends and meet new ones. Uh, so this is uh, this will launch off what Roland just presented. A little more of an overview of, of MIS deformity and, and where we've been, where we've where, uh, where we've come from, and where we're going. Um, so um, if you look at adult deformity. Uh, this is this is obviously where we've been, um, and just like degenerative spine, uh, there's been a consideration to potentially find better solutions where we've seen a lot of misery and pain, uh, difficulties and complications. But with MIS comes uh, some significant learning curves, uh, constantly evolving technologies, and and with that changing and somewhat unknown risks, and and those are things we have to navigate. But the incentive is there. Uh, traditional adult deformity surgery risks are tremendous, 50 to 75 percent. Uh, the morbidity relative to benefit remains at question from a societal and economic perspective. And there's greater difficulty in performing these surgeries in the elderly or infirm, uh, as well as the extreme costs. Uh, from the degenerative world, we've started to see some creep on the economy. Uh, of spine surgery and, and uh, professing that MIS techniques can actually uh, bend the cost curve down. Uh, and so one of the big questions that we'll have uh, to wrestle with is whether this can also apply to deformity surgery every time. There's been a fair bit of work over the past decade, decade and a half now, uh, with respect to deformity surgery and MIS combination. Uh, some of the early work uh, by Neil Anand showing that you know, relatively modest uh, coronal deformities could be addressed with respectable outcomes from a, a patient reported outcome measure perspective as well as radiographic outcomes. And compilations of studies have shown uh, various MIS deformity application benefits with less uh, blood loss, uh, markedly less ICU requirements. And then the, the episode of care costs, such as uh, the, the percentage of patients that go off to skilled nursing facilities or rehab tends to be considerably less when applying MIS principles to deformity correction. When you look at comparative studies uh, that we've done on MIS versus open surgery or, or what we call hybrid, which is a combination of those, uh, of those principles, uh, with 280 patients you see here uh, propensity matched, they all did fairly well in terms of outcome measures, uh, but there was considerably less EBL. Uh, with MIS surgery. And interestingly, and, and this gets to uh, one of the, the potential market benefits, is that we could address those deformities with fewer levels using MIS techniques in general and with lower major complications. So if you look at this, uh, this particular study um, that was uh, propensity matched for the initial deformity, uh, you find several good uh, uh, potential benefits to use MIS techniques, including this lower interop complication rate, uh, uh, and then circumferential MIS, which is essentially entirely MIS, uh, revealed a fairly uh, respectable outcome in all of those arenas. But as we started this, the technology was new. Uh, we were we were applying what we knew in degenerative spine to the deformity world, so technology wasn't quite where we needed to be, nor was our ability to, to deploy it. And so the initial question was, can we do the same things? Uh, and 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 the obvious question early was, not yet, uh, at least, if not no, in the end. But we started working into those more severe deformities with studies like this. Uh, where we looked at more severe adult scoliosis patients with more than 50 degrees of curve um, and a minimum two-year follow-up, looking specifically at inner body techniques used. And what we found was that uh, the lateral inner bodies were pretty powerful at correcting with a modicum of blood loss when, when we compared it to the other techniques. And the subgroup analysis amongst those inner body groups revealed that we uh, generally needed to deploy less celiac fixation, less EBL and transfusions occurred. There were less posterior segments fused or overall segments fused. And uh, lateral specifically, when comparing across those groups, achieved the greatest coronal correction. But certainly, there have to be limitations. And, and we looked at the ceiling effect um, somewhat early on. This is back in 2014, so very early, I would say, probably first decade of application of these MIS techniques. 
uh, looking at standalone circumferential MIS and hybrid techniques for uh, correcting deformity. And you could see here that, in fact, there was this uh, ceiling effect. We were really opening the posterior spine up in addition to interbody techniques to achieve correction in these more significant deformities. Uh, with respect to the sagittal plane, similar questions. Could, could we do as much? Could we accomplish as much? And, and early on, the, the 2017 paper was based on patients that we treated in the first part of that uh, decade with patients that had these more, uh, more profound sagittal vertical axis or sagittal plane deformities. We, we were really failing to achieve the corrections in the patient reported outcome measures uh, in those patients. Uh, and along came this sort of advancement in technology. Now, the, the idea of ACR started in the uh, 2006 to 2010 timeframe, but it was just conceptual. We were deploying it in sort of sporadic cases uh, and needed time to understand it, develop it. Uh, but as we did that, we started comparing our, our first uh, run at this against PSOs. And you can see here this compilation of PSO studies uh, out of Wash U and with Frank. Uh, Schwab, and in fact, the ACR was achieving similar corrections. And we went on to study this uh, with uh, the PSOs. And you can see here that uh, the ACR was able to accomplish uh, a very significant lumbar lordosis correction similar to PSOs. Uh, pelvic tilt, interestingly, uh, we, we didn't see any difference uh, from, but uh, the, between the ACR and PSO, but there was significant improvement in uh, in pelvic tilt, but essentially we came out of that thinking, well, hey, we've got something here for more profound deformities that we can stack up against PSOs with, with mobile disc spaces and achieve similar tilt corrections, lumbar lordosis, and global alignment. And we could do that with a modicum uh, and reduction in, in blood loss. And that was affirmed uh, by uh, Raj Sethi's group down the street here, where they compared uh, two different groups PSO versus uh, ACR, and you can see here a pretty profound difference in EBL, and, and importantly, a pseudoarthrosis rate differential. So how does that look in practice? Well, here's a, an example of a gentleman who had an MIS uh, uh, correction of his sagittal plane deformity. He had prior uh, a lumbar fusion below, I believe, what was this Denesis system above, uh, and that was uh, corrected with uh, an ACR above his prior fusion, and, uh, and then percutaneous screws below, mini open a lift uh, at the base. And, and so you, you get this ability now to correct uh, what are reasonably uh, significant deformities through MIS appropriations. The, the severe deformities um, remain a bit of an issue, but uh, the, the reality is now even those things can be potentially addressed. Hold on one second here. Um, I'm not sure we got the right, <laughs> the right, well, we'll blast through it. I think we didn't get the right talk on here. So just in the interest of time, I'll keep this one up. Um, so what are the options for sagittal plane correction? Well, we could do many open a lifts with hyperlordotic uh, implants and obviate the need for significant posterior work or PSOs. And this tends to be more profoundly impactful of pelvic tilt and, and the lumbosacral alignments that are, are more important uh, than ever with our understanding of spine shapes and uh, focused nature of, of some need of lumbosacral realignment. Uh, you have laterals, uh, which can be measured, uh, married with PCOs uh, to be more aggressive, and then ACRs, where we have a profound three-column ability to manipulate the spine and the sagittal plane, uh, and typically beyond P uh, COs and uh, PSOs. Now, interestingly, there's even MIS ways of achieving what Fred Sweet uh, started to do open, which is this transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion uh, approach or anterior column release through a posterior interbody approach. Uh, seemed a little scary to me, but they're uh, deploying that now in, in MIS uh, uh, mechanisms here. Small numbers of patients, uh, but uh, they've obviously started that, that run into the MIS approach for TLIF hypercorrections. And then, the, you know, the challenge is when you have, with MIS is uh, you have to be able to move on the fly. That's the one challenge with MIS. 
you, can, you need to achieve your alignment goals and you can't always stick to your guns with MIS. That's not the guiding principle. The guiding principle is where you get in the end. Uh, and so to, to, to that end, you might have to jump in with a posterior based osteotomy. Often that can be a, a minimally invasive PCO where you just uh, open the midline in a small area and leave the muscle envelope. Otherwise, you see that in the, on the right here versus what you see on the left, which would be just sort of buying it and not necessarily getting where you need to go. Uh, and, and Mike Wang's popularized this concept of doing a mini uh, open PSO, which uh, provides for that more powerful sagittal plane correction uh, without the formal aggressive open approach. So if you're going to use MIS, uh, you have to plan ahead. Uh, you have to understand what you're going to uh, accomplish with inner body reconstruction. Uh, and you have to be able to anticipate what that's going to hose you on when you go for coronal corrections uh, or what else you may need to add in on the backside. You also have to be, as I said, prepared for interoperative adjustments to your plan. Uh, not everything is going to work out just as you thought it might. And, and I want to reiterate, the alignment targets should be the goal, not the fact that you're doing it MIS. So the pearls for lateral in scoliosis generally are that uh, most often we're using the concavity for the approach, and that just allows us to be very strategic and use single incision to get to all these levels. As you see on the upper right, uh, the uh, single incision can be used from top to bottom. Uh, the L4-5 tilt, as you see on the bottom uh, screen, of the screen on the right, will derive that need in many cases. But essentially, you can't get to L4-5 from the opposite side than the concavity. So between those two principles, you'll, you'll uh, be choosing your approach in general if you're going to four or five. And then uh, notably, you want to work top down. Uh, it uh, doesn't seem intuitive to you do it, but you're building the spine away from yourself and you're correcting the scoliosis and the focality relative to your incision. So if you work top down, you, you slowly derotate the spine and push the upper level away from yourself as you slowly unwind the spine with your, uh, your disc work. The pitfalls. You have to understand the baseline sagittal and coronal alignment and bony dysmorphic features, uh, and in particular, the fractional curve. That will get you into tremendous trouble doing MIS work, which is, is, uh, tends to be primarily laterally based or anterior large cage based. So if you have a, a fractional curve, as you see here on the left, uh, with a dysmorphic L5 vertebral body, and you start building off that, you're going to create a coronal deformity that's incredibly hard to recover from. Mm. Uh, so uh, whereas you may not do this in open deformity, you want to do a lot of looking at coronal recons, whether it's MR, I, I favor CT, so you really can understand what's happening at the disc level and bony level before you, you go down that road. Uh, here's an example of, uh, of a patient that had a, a fairly slight lumbar curve, uh, had laterals, uh, to, to address that, and you can see that kicks him off, uh, and that that was uh, addressed with an asymmetric a lift. The other challenge with the laterals and ACRs, in particular, are distributional. Um, how, how do we favor uh, spine shape now with laterally based work, and and that takes additional planning in the sagittal plane. So you can see here a patient uh, who had a combination of laterals and ACR probably overcorrected in the sagittal plane, or certainly with an ACR that's a little higher, uh, maybe not distributing the lordosis quite as well. Uh, another one here. So this brings up this sort of evolution of where we're going in, in spinal alignment targeting for deformity, and this will need to apply to MIS. You see are the Rousseli types that we need to look at, and then favoring this concept of, of uh, aligning uh, lumbar pelvic axis the thoracic pelvic angle um, uh, from work out of uh, Mike Kelly and, and uh, his colleagues. And really, this is um, hopefully going to address some of the mechanical complications that occur, whether you're doing open or MIS. But because you're putting inner bodies in, in general that are very restrictive to adjustment, uh, the planning ahead becomes even more critical uh, with the MIS application towards deformity. So uh, we're using this sort of targeting now uh, in our planning, whether we're using inner bodies or just doing open deformity to inform uh, where we want to go from a targeting perspective. 
this this work that we've done on MAS deformity has also culminated in some guidance for the community on uh, when to apply it. Uh, not necessarily exactly how to apply it, but where to sort of guide folks into uh, utilizing MIS deformity techniques in a little more appropriate fashion, not getting out in front of their skis. And so this, uh, this minimally invasive deformity algorithm you can see here, which I won't belabor going through, uh, is in the literature. And you can use that to give you some sense of what you're going to need to accomplish corrections given baseline deformity you see on the top and to the right. The other advent that's making life perhaps a little more predictable with MIS are these customization of inner body implants. I don't know where that will go, but it certainly helps uh, conceptually with the, the fractional curves and, and bony dysmorphic features that we run into. Uh, then you're not so worried about going to the back and, and dropping percutaneous screws because you've reconstructed in the coronal plane in an effective way. Uh, through these inner body implants. If it's fairly slight, you can do little things like rotating ALF cages or cutting your own uh, custom allografts, uh, but you have to address that coronal deformity before you go to the back and expect to drop percutaneous screws. So if you're doing, um, if you're doing laterals um, and, and ACRs in particular, you have to know you got a disk space to get through. Uh, you have to know that you have favorable an anatomy to work through. So. Uh, examples here on the top would be reasonable to approach. The bottom would not be an ideal uh, case, certainly for an ACR. Uh, historically, we have not done as much at L4-5, uh, simply because the anatomy is less predictable. Retraction times are probably uh, more challenging to achieve in favor of, of lumbar plexus tolerance. Uh, and you have to circumferentially execute an annular release in general, and that can be a little bit uh, concerning from a vascular perspective for the reason you see on the bottom right, where you go to the far side and it's, uh, it's non-visible, you can create trouble. So you, got, you have to have a safe corridor generally, um, even though the nerves migrate posteriorly on the ca concavity and the vessels migrate posteriorly on the concavity, um, there's corridor there to work with and, and you have to navigate that with, uh, nav, uh, with uh, nerve navigation equipment, uh, but it's quite doable. The, um, the other concern and thought for an ACR is where the vascular anatomy exists. So if you look at most uh, patients with, uh, with respect to the vein in particular, the right side approach will favor you protecting the vein and the far side on the left, you generally won't have, um, you won't have any vascular anatomy to be concerned about. So you'll have the aorta more centrally, and you can uh, you can get to that far corner and release it without concern. You're gonna you're gonna get something you don't want to see, which is a big bleed. Um, if you look at this shot here uh, on D, the cava or the venous structures will often be right in the sweet spot of the hardest part to release, which is that far corner. So generally, the right-sided approach tends to be a little uh, happier, friendlier, less uh, concerning. But you still have to have a very thorough knowledge of the lateral approach. Be very efficient at a standard lateral. You're going to do a discectomy first. You want to be able to do that in 10 to 15 minutes max, very routinely, so that you're not having to spend extraordinary amounts of time subsequent to that doing the release. Um, and obviously, you don't want to be dealing with a lot of scar. So in terms of... Uh, applying that, you, you have to have retractor space that's very significant, more than most people historically felt comfortable with the lateral approach. You really need to have 75% of that disk space uh, exposed, and then you have to drop the, the uh, anterior retractor in front, which you see here, in front of the ALL. Uh, you want to slide that between the uh, vessels and the ALL, and have that retractor sitting to the far side of the segment, really over the pedicle or beyond. And that's going to give you the maximum protection for those anterior structures that you do not want to uh, mess with. So you, once you get that in position, you do a standard discectomy, and, uh, and then you can take the ALL in a variety of ways. You just want it to be efficient. You can use a knife to cut into the disc space. Uh, you can use a, um, a more of a chisel, uh, but you want to stay behind that that uh, anterior retractor. Once you've accomplished that, you can put your inner body device in, uh, which will tend to want to go out the front. That's why you have to park your retractor in the, in the posterior 25% of the vertebral uh, disk space. 
the, there is occasion where you have to final release the disk space, and you do that uh, either with a curette or you can use the, the trials or uh, spreaders, uh, but you have to be a little bit cautious. Those anterior ligaments, if you don't fully release them, are very powerful, and you'll piston into the bone before they'll, they'll comply with you. Um, we wrestled with this uh, for a while, uh, whether to use one or two screws. Turns out that most of the time we were going to do posterior releases with these, which is a highly destabilizing maneuver once you've taken the ALL out. So generally we've got for bipolar screws to prevent escape, um, not necessarily the cage, but just a difficulty controlling in three dimensions the whole segment of spine once you release the back. Uh, that constrains the spine from spreading and allows you to dial it in um, and up to 30, 30 to 40 degrees depending on your cage uh, rating. So I will skip the, uh, the, the demonstration there just because I know we're short on time and need to get to the lab. Any questions? Uh, it's a great talk, uh, and again, I think you know uh, we're lucky to have uh, speakers like, like you that again kind of uh, understand and uh, and then follow the basic principles of spine surgery and yet push forward these uh, new techniques. Um, can you talk a bit about the vascular risk uh, with ACR, which it gives me a little bit of trepidation, and how you uh, how you avoid that? Sure. Uh, well, by the data, and, and these are people that have, are very facile lateral, and certainly with the MIS subgroup, there isn't any. I mean, we haven't seen any, any major vascular bleeds. Wow. It, it's a concern every time I do it, but the key is to be able to get separation and, and retraction, just like the spoon you saw uh, Manish put in before you go to do any work there. So if you're thoughtful about doing that, it's, it's generally not a concern for me. Where you should be concerned is if you can't get a retractor safely placed. Um, or if you have anterior ossophytes that are sitting ventral and cradle the vessels, you're, you're not going to be able to get a, an adventitial space created safely. Uh, so if you try to force it through improper planning or intraoperatively, you can't get safe retraction, then, then you're going to have a problem. So you have to you know, bend, bend in the wind like a reed when you need to, be thoughtful. But I don't see it as, as a concern any greater than a VCR if you need to do that. You just have to be thoughtful and, and, and most importantly, facile at that approach because you don't have the same exposure either. Right. So you have to be capable and comfortable with getting your retractor in, getting in front of the ALL uh, routinely with retractors before you take that leap. Right. And, and probably most importantly, very different than most of the spine that we do, preoperatively assessing imaging for aberrancy and unusual nature of position for vessels. Amir? Alex? Beautiful cases. Um, I had a question more about pelvic fixation. So the traditional teaching is that if it's above L3 and you go down to the sacrum, that you should protect the S1 screws with iliac, screw, uh, iliac bolts, uh, at a lot of cases were much higher yeah. and stopped at S1. So I want to ask you about, you know, what are the rates of S1 um, failures, sacral fractures? Um, because in the open world, we're now going to dual iliac yeah. bolts on each side. So it's this very stark contrast between MIS doing very little pelvic fixation and the open world doing more. Right. So... So uh, there's a couple factors there, in my opinion. One is that I, I think um, a fair number of the MIS surgeons um, did not necessarily appreciate all the avenues to put in iliac fixation. There was actually a reticence to do it because of technical proficiency or lack of proficiency. Uh, that's changed. In fact, I, th I think I taught Juan how to do his first PERC S2AI. So you, those things are deployable now. Now it's going to be about biomechanics and biology. If you're doing MIS deformity, most, most of the folks are doing a -lifts at the base. So there's more structural support, less screw strain, less rod strain. In my opinion, to your point, I think we're moving in a direction where it, it's not going to be advisable probably to do probably L2, maybe L3 and above without 
securing and protecting from, from the catastrophic failures that could happen at the base. Now that all comes down to bone integrity. I think the four rod construct versus the two rod construct still will remain a debate relative to what your inner body support is, bone health, and maybe SI joint issues. You know, that's, that's still something we're working out scientifically. But I, yeah, I, the point is, I think iliac fixation is probably the right thing to do. It can easily be done MIS, I do that routinely. Um, and you can even do two screws. You just use a little midline skin incision near the lumbosacral junction and, and you can deploy them with just fluoro if you want, but certainly with nav, it's, it's easy. Okay. Roland? Yeah, just uh, to piggyback on that, actually, with, with a lot of the enabling technologies, navigation, et cetera, I find that's almost the most enjoyable part of the case is to do the uh, pelvic fixation. You know, if, if you video gamify your spine surgery, you know, it makes it that much easier to do those uh, particular portions. But what I wanted to ask you really quick, um, you know, with the anterior column reconstruction, as opposed to posterior techniques, generally with posterior techniques, those are those are shortening techniques of the spine, right? Uh, versus our anterior column reconstruction, which again, and you know, with your uh, presentation and my presentation, those are generally long, elongating procedures of the spine. Any special considerations that you take into effect for prevention of over elongation of the neural elements uh, when looking at these patients, et cetera? Um, not, not necessarily in the lumbar spine, although I tell you, the L5 palsy remains the you know one of the banes of our existence to an a lifts and not just deformity. I, I think if patients have very collapsed 5-1 levels for a long period of time, even if they're not listeased, they're just subject to that risk, and it's hard to anticipate who's going to get it, who's not. But it's still, in my mind, the right thing to do for them from a, a lumbosacral alignment perspective. I wouldn't give up that critical level uh, just for that few percent that that develop a bad palsy. Um, and you know, what's the alternative? An L5 PSO, which probably has a similar level of palsy, right? So um, I, the other levels I haven't had any concern about. The vascular concern, you know, we, when we started doing ACRs in particular, but certainly multi-level laterals where you're really lengthening the spine, there was concern about vascular risk, calcifications, are we gonna rupture vessels? We certainly talked about it. And we were a little trepid at the beginning, but we've never really seen that pan out to be an issue for whatever reason. There must be enough compliance. Okay. All right. Great. Lab Thank guy. You. We should probably go to the break oh. exhibitors. Okay. Um, you know,